2003. We're in the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And my name is Stephen Goldfarb, and I'm assisted by Francis Hopkins Westbrook. I'm a volunteer, and Mrs. Westbrook is on the staff. We have today a visitor, and I would like him to identify himself at this time. My name is Henry Maslia, M-A-S-L-I-A. I was born September 15, 1925, in Izmir, Turkey. I am a U.S. citizen, and I served in the Navy during World War II aboard an aircraft carrier, the USS Omni Bay. Tell us a little bit about you growing up, I understand, here in Atlanta. Your parents, <coughs> your brothers, sisters, that sort of thing. I came to Atlanta when I was six months old. Uh, my father had been here before World War I. He had a little shoe shop in Little Five Points for 42 years, Moreland Avenue Shoe Shop. And I grew up in a community of Sephardic Jews. We had a small congregation, Orbe Shalom. We had a house that we used as our house of worship on Central Avenue. <clears throat> and my whole world was revolved around that community of immigrants. I did not know any person that was born and raised in it in America. All the people I knew, the grown-ups, were born in Turkey, the Isle of Rhodes, in Greece, and they were all Sephardics and they all spoke Ladino, which was a 15th century Spanish with modifications along the way. Uh, we ate Sephardic foods. We, did not, we didn't have steaks at home. We did not have hamburgers. We ate Sephardic food, which was basically a lot of vegetables and very little meat. Uh, <clears throat> I went to public high schools, uh, and my parents spoke to me in Ladino. I understood them, but I returned their questions with, in English. I went to George Avenue Elementary School. <clears throat> I enrolled in junior high school at Hoke Smith Junior High, but my parents transferred me to Bass Junior High in Little Five Points because that's where my father's shoe shop was, and my mama wanted to get me out from underfoot, so I went to Bass Junior High, and I finished there. Upon completion there, I went to Boys High uh, School on Parkway, we had schools in uh, these portables, and it never hurt us a bit. We had an excellent education. I finished high school in January of 1943. The war was going on then. America was involved fully by that time. And all the boys, when they reached 18 years old, were going to get drafted. Well, I delayed that. <clears throat> I was still 17 when I graduated. I got, went to Georgia Tech for one semester. And then in June of 43, I decided I might as well go ahead and get into this thing because they're going to get me in September, my birthday. So I did not like walking in mud, which I knew soldiers did that. So I volunteered to go into the Navy. Little did I know I was going to have a big swim later on. Uh, I went to uh, Pensacola for my boot training, <clears throat> and after I finished my boot training, boot camp training, uh, there were several uh, schools that were available. Let me stop you for just a moment. Tell us a little bit about what boot, train, boot camp was like. I don't remember an awful lot about it. I know we had to get up and go to eat at certain times. We were required to do this, that, and the other. And they taught us how to march in unison and what have you. It's been a long time. Now. I don't remember exactly. I, I remember uh, I, I volunteered to box. I was a, I was not much of a sports person to start off with, but I got involved boxing and I knocked this guy out. It scared the dickens out of me. I never knocked a person out in my life. But anyway, when I finished boot camp, there were several schools available, and I went to this fellow who's in charge of that, and I said, what's the first school that I can get into to get out of boot camp? I wanted to get out because we did not have shore leave and liberty in boot camp. You were confined to the camp. And he said, well, I can send you to ordinance school. I can get you there in, in next week. I said, okay, I'll take that. I didn't even know what I was getting into, but I wanted to get out. So I became an aviation ordinanceman. 
Now, aviation ordnance has to do with anything of the armament that, an air, that a Navy airplane carries. I'd never had a gun in my life in my hand growing up, and then I learned all about guns. Uh, first, I went to school in Jacksonville, but very short time. Then they transferred me to uh, Oklahoma, uh, to the University of Oklahoma. They had a big training school there, ordnance school. And so I learned how to disassemble uh, uh, machine guns, how to disassemble and reassemble pistols. I knew nothing about arm, but I, arms, but I did learn. And then I went to a uh, uh, to Yakima, not Yakima, but uh, there's a little, little town in Washington, state of Washington. There was a Naval Reserve Station, they flight train. I stayed there for a while, and then I was transferred to go to Pearl Harbor. Uh, so I went there. Uh, they trans. I went to Seattle, boarded a destroyer, which stopped in San Francisco on our way to Honolulu. And then they got to Honolulu. And the first thing I went got when I got to Honolulu, we had uh, it was about time to eat, and we had pineapple for dessert. I'll never forget that. So I was stationed to a training a, a, a squadron there on in Pearl Harbor. Excuse me, let me ask you, could you, when you went to Pearl Harbor, could you see what was left over from the, t the previous two years of bombardment? Very little. Uh, I, I was not there for sightseeing, so I didn't see an awful lot. I was actually stationed right there at Pearl Harbor on that little island uh, where a lot of the bombardment did happen. And, uh, but, <clears throat> Now, all I had to do at that time, the, the way the rules went, it, uh, you had to serve 18 months overseas, and then you could go back home for a leave. So all I had to do, if I had any sense, was just behave, stay at Pearl Harbor for 18 months, and then I could go home safe and sound and have me a leave. Well, I got into trouble. I'm a troublemaker. So the, I said, I want to get out of here, and I want some sea duty. Well, they were happy to accommodate me, and on the first carrier that came along, uh, aboard uh, along there at Pearl Harbor, they put me on that carrier, and the name of that carrier was the USS Omni Bay CVE-79. Omni Bay is a little bay in the Alaska area. It was named after that bay. From there, we shipped out to the Pacific into the war area. And the first thing that I saw, we docked at the Solomon Islands, which had been uh, finally secured. And I saw these natives come out in these boats, and they wanted to sell us trinkets. And I thought that was sort of fascinating. Can you give us a date for that particular? Do you, do you remember the sequence of well, dates? Yeah. I, hold one second. I got it here. I've got a whole thing here. If you don't mind, let me find it. I got, here it is. The ships. Oh, wait a minute. Now. All right, we. We left Pearl Harbor. You, you, am I on now? Yes, sir. Uh, the ship left from Pearl Harbor, and we sailed to Tulagi to rehearse for the invasion of the Palu Islands. From September 11, that's 1944, until the beginning of October, Omni Bay stood off Palau and Angula Islands and provided air cover for the fleet and close support strikes for the forces above. The, you want me to re the Omni Bay then sailed to Manus, a little island there, to renew her depleted stock of fuel and ammunition, then joined Rear Admiral Stump's Taffy II for the invasion of Leyte. At the beginning of the battle off Samar on October 25, the escort carriers began launching airstrikes in an effort to cripple as many of the approaching enemy force as possible. In the ensuing battle, Omni Bay's planes contributed the sinking of one Japanese cruiser and helped to damage a number of other warships. 
Omni Bay launched some six strikes that day and helped to turn threatened defeat into victory. The carrier spent the month of November. Can you go ahead and now tell us your impressions of that battle? You, you I assume, remember it vividly. The, the invasion of Palau, we, as a sailor, in the trenches on that ship, I didn't even see that island. We were so far away from it. And we did not see any enemy aircraft, enemy ships, nothing. It was just like taking a cruise in the Pacific, except we were on duty launching our ships, and getting them to go and, and soften up the, the, the shores for the landing. So that was just like a cruise in the Pacific, almost and that you, particular one. And, and your, your duties were to uh, arm the airplanes. Right. When they came in, you put, uh, uh, give us just a little bit about the kind of armament they had. And, and well, the, the planes that we had, uh, uh, they were SBDs, which, uh, which is, I don't know, I forgot, <laughs> but they, it was a dive bomber uh, type of thing, and they had to, now my recollection is a little fuzzy, but if, if I recall, they had 50 caliber guns on those planes, and they also had the capability of, of loading uh, bombs of different kinds. And that's what we did now uh, as, a, as the ordinance when our job was to get that plane fully loaded for its takeoff, to, to make sure the guns were clean, had plenty of ammunition, the bombs. Now they let the, uh, uh, the I was just a lowly seaman first class, so I was not uh, trained enough yet, or they were not letting me have that responsibility of putting the bombs and arming them. Uh, they did that with the senior uh, ordinancemen. But, and uh, I did the grunt duties like somebody had to take those bullets out of the big cases and put them into these belts. You've seen these belts, and that was one of the grunt duties that a, a lowly seaman, first class ordinanceman did. Uh, and then we had to keep the, uh, we had uh, our ordnance shack. Uh, each particular uh, division of the ship. There were different divisions. There were electricians, there were uh, uh, aviation electricians, there were machine, and you worked within your little group, and we had our ordnance shack, and we had our Joe in the morning. That's what they call coffee. And we'd have our meetings and what we got to do in our assignments, and that's what we did. How and many, then, How many people were in your group? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember how many Did any, were. Anybody of that group stand out? Anybody you still keep contact with? Yes, we have a reunion every two years from our little uh, uh, Omni Bay, the whole Omni Bay. And uh, I've, I've, I went to the first reunion, which was in Wisconsin. And uh, we have a reunion this year in Chicago, but I'm not going to that. I don't want to go to Chicago. It's too busy. But uh, yeah, and I, some of them have passed on, but we still have a reunion of the whole ship. I don't know how much longer we're going to have them, though, because they're fading away. But Good, and so then pick it up again where the battle took place. And so that was for the Palau Islands, and we secured that. Then, then I'll have to read what we did after Palau. Uh, I, the Omni Bay sailed to Manus to renew her depleted stock of fuel and ammunition. Uh, by the way, let me stop there. When we'd go to Manus, we would have recreation. And we, the ships would drop anchor way offshore. They did not have big old piers to dock up to. And then they would take us in these little small boats to Manus. And what they did, we had, they had a place for playing baseball and you could, horseshoes. And they gave you two cans of beer. Now, we were not allowed alcoholic beverage. Only officers were allowed that. But they, gave, they were very kind to us, and they gave us two cans of beer when we went to Manus. At that particular point in time, I was not a beer drinker. I did not drink alcohol growing up in Atlanta in my house. And so what I did, I sold each can for a dollar. That was big money. And so we just lounged around and relaxed. So going on, uh, we, went, uh, we went to Manus for refueling. We joined Rear Admiral Stump's Taffy II for the invasion of Leyte. At the beginning of the battle off of Samar on October 25, 
the escort carriers began launching airstrikes in an effort to cripple as many of the approaching enemy, pos uh, enemy forces as possible. I read, uh, read all that. The carriers spent the month of November at Manus and Casal Passage for availability and replenishment. I'll never forget that November, Thanksgiving Day, we were in dry dock at that at Manus, and they lifted that whole carrier out of the water. It, uh, it was amazing how they do that, and, they, and we had Thanksgiving dinner in dry dock. I'll never forget that November Thanksgiving. It was a nice meal, too. Then, from 12 to 17 December, we operated in the Mindanao and Sulu Seas in support of operations on the island of Mindanora. We participated in that invasion. On the 15th, a day of heavy enemy air attacks, she splashed an enemy bomber as it died from the sh for the ship from the Port Byron. I'll never forget that one, too. I was standing above on the flight deck, and we were, the anti-aircraft guns were going all around us in the enemy airplane, and I saw this plane approaching, and I said, holy cow, that thing's going to hit us. But we were very lucky we got him before and, and hit him before he came and hit us. On 19th of December, she returned to Coastal Passage to prepare for the landings in Lingayen Gulf. The Omni Bay left on New Year's Day, 1945, and transited Surigao Strait two days later. The next afternoon, while in the Sulu Sea, a twin-engine Japanese suicide plane penetrated the screen undetected and made for Omni Bay. I learned later, subsequently, the way that plane was able to come in undetected, they would come in very low level behind mountains, and then all of a sudden they'd go over the mountain, and the, and the radar screens couldn't pick them up behind those mountains. That's how they were able to approach us. The plane nicked her, her island, then crashed her starboard side. Two bombs were released. One of them penetrated the flight deck and detonated below, setting off a series of explosions from the fully gassed planes on the forward third of the hangar deck. The second bomb passed through the hangar deck, ruptured the fire main on the second deck, and exploded near the starboard side. Now, what happened at that day, for me personally, I was off duty. That was January the 4th. So, being an old chow hound, I was the first one in the chow line waiting for the line to open. The line finally did open at 5 o'clock that day. Uh, the mess deck was below the hangar deck, and uh, I went and got my, uh, you had a tray that, that you got your food on, and I remember what we had that night. We had spaghetti for dinner that night. And I had commenced eating, and the next thing I know, I heard this big, tremendous crash. And it was loud, and I said, holy mackerel, something's wrong. So I ran back up to the flight, uh, to the hangar deck, and up forward, as this uh, described, it was all of flames and smoke. So I said, woo, I better get my life jacket. Now, you were supposed to wear your life jacket all the time, but they, it was hot out there in the Pacific. So I had mine hanging on the bulkhead. That's what we call a wall, a bulkhead. And it was the kind you'd snap around your waist, and it had two little t t uh, oxygen or whatever tanks, and you would squeeze them, and that would inflate it. So I put on my thing, and I put, squeezed them, and it didn't inflate. And I said, holy mackerel, what am I going to do now? So I went back to the fantail. That's the aft end of the ship. It's a big little area back there. And the people were congregating back there, and nobody knew what to do. We knew there was something wrong somewhere, and we just stood around. And I remember this, uh, this, this he was a Mexican, and, and, and it got to him. He was going around babbling to himself. He, he, couldn't, he didn't handle it very well. So now, uh, we were just standing around. Now, con to continue, what happened, the water pressure forward was lost immediately along with power and bridge communications. 
men struggling with the terrific blazes on the hangar deck soon had to abandon it because of the heavy black smoke from the burning planes and ricocheting 50 caliber ammunition. Escorts could not lend their power to the f fight because of exploding ammunition and intense heat from the fires. By 1750, that's 550 in the afternoon, the entire topside area had become untenable and the stored torpedo warheads threatened to go off at any time. The order to abandon ship was given. Now, when we and when I heard the abandoned ship thing, I said, holy mackerel, I got to get in that water and I ain't got a life jacket. Now, the ship at that time was moving along very slowly. It wasn't just standing still. And men were jumping off all along that side there. I was on the port side. Was it listing at all? No. No, never did list. And uh, so I had to find something to hold on to because I, I, mean, I could swim a little bit, but I knew I might be in the water for hours and I needed to hold on to something. So. Uh, men uh, up forward there were dropping things over the side so they could uh, land on those and get on them. So I was hoping I could get one of those uh, big old floats that you could get up on top of and get out of the water, but I was not that fortunate. And there were these, uh, 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 these ropes with corks, and they float. So I, as one came, I jumped and timed it right so that I grabbed a hold of that, but I'm still in the water, but I'm not going to sink. So now I'm thinking, holy mackerel, what if there are sharks? Because that's the first thing that came to my mind. The second thing came to my mind is we need to get away. There was some other guys hanging on to this net. And I said, we need to paddle our way to get away from that ship because if she sinks now, we're going to get sucked under. So we sort of paddled our way away from the ship. I don't remember how many guys were on there. So finally, now, you have to remember, on our way to this invasion, this was the biggest armada of ships I'd ever seen in the time that I was out there. And we had, sh and carriers always had an escort. They were there to, pr to pick up pilots who uh, uh, might have uh, gone off the side of the ship, to pick up guys who might have fought. We always had car uh, escorts along with us. So all the escort carriers start gathering up all the people out of the water. And I was picked up by this little escort destroyer. You remember the name? I think it was the Burns. Uh, I've got some history here. Uh, it might have been the Burns, I think it was, that I was picked up. And what they did, they picked me up. Now, I'll have to give you my personal experience now. They picked me up, and they put me aboard this destroyer. They gave us some uh, uh, clothing, fed us, uh, uh, and took care of us, having picked us up out of the water. How long were you in the water? I don't remember, but it wasn't, I don't think it was a long time, maybe 30 minutes. The only thing I have remaining from that is this dog tag. I, I had that on my person at the time, and I still got this little dog tag. That was the only thing I, uh, of my possessions, because everything, of course, went down with the ship. So uh, we got aboard this destroyer. Now, a destroyer did not have enough room to provide space for these uh, people that had been picked up out of the water. So what they did then in the middle of the night, it was pitch black out there. And that you could, in those days, you couldn't even light a cigarette. You couldn't light a match because of enemy could see that from miles away. Even a match uh, lit up. So you, you had total darkness. And this destroyer pulled up alongside a battleship. It was the New USS New Mexico. And they put planks between the two ships. And we had to go f across there to the New Mexico. And uh, I was just a little kid. The, the ships are moving. They're standing still, if I recall. Okay. But still, you know, water makes you move. <laughs> so I'm looking at these two planks. 
And I can still remember what I was thinking. I say, holy mackerel, what if I fall off and get crushed between these two? This was going through my 19-year-old mind because I've always been a sort of sensible person. So anyway, I made it across there to the New, uh, New Mexico. There were several of us. And what they did, uh, speaking of the whole crew, they got scattered. The whole crew got scattered, and they, they were put into different ships along the way. But I was put aboard the USS New Mexico battleship. So coming aboard there now, they had to account for us, so they took roll call, and then they assigned us to certain duties aboard that just to help. Uh, uh, and then since they didn't have uh, enough bunks, the real bunks, I had to sleep in a hammock on that uh, ship, which I had the experience of doing that. And then uh, that battleship, of course, I guess they were 16-inch guns up forward and back. And then they had on the port side and the starboard side, they had three what they call casements. And these were five-inch guns, in addition to all the anti-aircraft anti guns. So they assigned me to the middle casement on the port side. There was the first, second, and third. I was in the middle there. And I would just sit back in the corner, and if they wanted me to do something, I was available. But the crew, they knew their duties when they were firing those guns. And so the, the, uh, the landings commenced. Now, you've seen in the movies how these battleships were lined up, and they were shooting these big guns to soften up the shore. And that's what we were doing on the New Mexico. And when, they, when the big guns were in, in action, nobody could stand on the top side, the top deck, because the, the, the sound was deafening. So you, you didn't have anybody on top side when the big guns were going off. And then uh, I was in this thing. At, now normally th there's a, 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 not a door, but a port uh, between each one of these three. And I would sit in this corner and that door was usually open even when they were firing. Now, I think it was either the second day I was on that, that New Mexico or maybe the third. Uh, the hatch, that's what they call them, not a door, was closed that day between the first and the second one. A kamikaze also hit the New Mexico. And it hit the bridge, and the, and the story was that it killed the captain of the ship, and there was a visiting admiral from uh, the British Navy who was killed in that kamikaze. But of course, that did not sink that big old battleship. And I'll never forget this scene. Uh, I opened up the hatch up to that forward five-inch gun, and it was like hamburger meat scattered all over that place because that kamikaze had come down and hit that side of the ship, the port side. And I'll never forget it. That night, at about midnight or so, I saw, and you've seen them in the in, in newsreels and movies and all, a burial at sea. And I, I witnessed that. I'd never seen that before. So I got scared by that time. <laughs> I hadn't really been scared up until that time. I said, man, I got to get out from here and kick you some another plane hit. So I decided to go down below that deck. And man, that was big, thick ski, uh, steel and all. Well, during general quarters, I was down there alone and under a big old meat block table and scared as the devil. But I couldn't see or hear anything. All I could hear th noise up topside. And this ain't going to do. I'm going to take my chance. I'm going back up to that turret. So when the all clear was sound, I went back up to the turret. But after the uh, they had finally landed uh, the troops and, and uh, done their job, me personally then, uh, they transferred referred me to an LST. This was one of those landing ships and they uh, that took us to an island somewhere. And uh, at that place I boarded a troop transport ship. And there were a lot of us on that ship from our ship and we went the southern route to get back to the states. And I'll never forget that troop transport. They only allowed you to have fresh water shower for one hour a day. The rest of it was salt water. So you become very 
uh, creative when you have adverse situations. So what I did, somehow or another, I found a bucket and a chain and a lock. And where I was asleep, I chained that to my bunk when the fresh water was on. And then I would do what they call a marine douche, you know, just use that fresh water to clean myself. Now, this is sort of not pleasant, what I'm going to tell you, but it was an experience that I'll never forget. Now, what on our ship, on the carrier, we had individual toilet stools. Very close by, but at least it was a toilet stool, and you flushed it. But on this troop transport, they had two sides there and they had a long trough and you just sat there on that and so I decided well I want to be sort of by myself so I sat on the end there well that was a bad mistake I should have sat in the middle because as the ship swayed the water splashed and I was on the end I'll never forget that that's a bad mistake but anyway uh, we finally finally uh, arrived at San Francisco. And what, give us an approx at least an approximate date. Well, it was in, in the, well, uh, my ship was sunk on January the 4th. Let's see. If it, mm, I can give you this date. I got 30 days survivor's leave is what they call that. And I was home in Atlanta on my survivor's leave when President Roosevelt died in April of that year. That's the time frame I remember. Uh, it took us a long time to come from that area back to San Francisco because uh, it was a slow ship and they went that route to avoid maybe Japanese submarines. So it took us, I think, 45 days to make that trip. I don't recall exactly. Let me just ask one question about mm -hmm. the carrier. Do you know, have any idea of how much loss of life there yeah. was? Did you miss any, did, any yeah. of your buddies? Yeah. Close to uh, a total of 95 Navy, Navy men were lost, inclu including two killed on an assisting tor destroyer when torpedo warheads on the carrier's hangar deck finally went off. Mm -hmm. We lost approximately 10% of our crew uh, on that uh, because of the kamikaze. We, we had approximately 900 men on that ship. Now it's April. Uh, so now I'm home on leave. And, uh, President I've, Roosevelt, of course, died 70 miles from where you were. Yeah, Warm Springs. And uh, I remember that part of it, too. You know, back then we didn't have te television, of course, and you saw that on your newsreels and pictures in the newspaper. So then I went back. I was then assigned to a little naval training base in King City, California, right in the, I don't know what valley it's in. Let me, let me stop. Do you want to just go ahead and elaborate any on Roosevelt's death and um, how people were affected by it? Oh, yeah, man. Everybody in America loved that man at that time. I don't care if he was a Democrat. Now, I'm, I'm political now, but he was our president. That's the only president I really knew uh, growing up. And uh, then you saw uh, that fellow that played the accordion. I forget his name, and the tears were in his eyes, and that train going up. You didn't to, go down and look at the train, did you? No. Yeah, Graham Jackson was his name, and oh yeah, everybody in America was just sad and tears with everybody. Uh, it might have been even more emotional than JFK's, I don't know. Both of them were very emotional to the American public, but uh, yeah, uh, they had the, you could see it on the newsreel, that's about all you had back then. But uh, going back to my assignment, I was stationed to King City, and uh, City, California. California. That's approximately 20 miles south of Salinas, Monterey, and uh, that other exclusive, Carmel. And, I've, and I, in, in those days, servicemen in California, all you had to do was get on a highway and stick your thumb out, and everybody would give you a ride. Nobody was afraid to give you a ride back then as a serviceman. And I hitched hike all over that place. I went to Sacramento. I went to uh, Salinas and Monterey and 
Carmel. Now, I was stationed at King City when Jap Japan surrendered, and I was in Carmel that day. I'll never forget. We had a big celebration at Carmel. So um, I'm in King City, and I got bored there, so I asked for sea duty, so I went back to sea on another carrier. It's called the USS uh, Admiralty Bay, the CVE-99, which had been converted to a troop transport. And on the hangar deck, they had constructed bunks to accommodate all these troops that we were bringing back from the Pacific. And I served a short term of duty on that carrier, bringing troops back to the States. And by that time now, they were starting to discharge people from the services but it was a point system that they had devised. And the, if the longer you'd been in and the longer you'd had a combat duty, the more points you had. Well, I didn't have quite enough points because I only got in in 1943. So my time was not up until April of 1946. So in the meantime, what they did with me, they parked me in the Mojave Desert there was a marine air station there and what did they do they put me assigned me to the fire department and I didn't know what I would do if we had a fire <laughs> but anyway my number came up so what I did uh, I used the system what they would do back then is the 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 service the Navy would pay you your fare back to where you enlisted or were drafted which was Atlanta. So what I did, I got discharged in California, Long Beach, California, and I got the money to go from Long Beach back to Atlanta, which was a nice tidy sum. And then how I got back home, back then, I don't know if they still do it, you could hop a military plane that was going your way. So I, I went to a place, I don't remember where it was, and it, you might have had to wait a day or two, but I finally caught a plane going somewhere in South Carolina. I don't remember where. And I went to South Carolina, then I hitchhiked back to Atlanta, and I got home. And everybody was happy to see you, no doubt. Yeah, I was alive, <laughs> unscathed. Let me ask you, do you have brothers and sisters? I have a half-brother and a half-sister. My mother died when I was three years old. My father remarried her sister. Back then, that's the way they did. He, you got to remember, he was an immigrant. He was used to his kind of cooking, his language, and he just couldn't go out to a singles bar and find somebody to marry. So he went back to, uh, to a family, apparently, that he knew, and he married her sister, which was my stepmother. And I have, and both of them live here in Atlanta. Did they, did they serve in the military at all? Mm, my brother was later on, he was in the Army because he graduated, and, but he never he saw young, combat. Yeah, too young. Now, did you do the GI Bill? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's God, get, tell, tell us a little bit. I, I don't that. even know why I did it, but I'll tell you, I still think I had good common sense even when I was 19. I knew that was a great opportunity to get a free education. That's what it amounted to. And so, uh, yep, and I, I wrote it all the way till I had no more time where left. Did you go to school and what did you study? <laughs> I w the first thing was, uh, <clears throat> let's see now, when I came back in April, I went one more time in the fall to Georgia Tech. You already had some tech. I had one semester of tech. I went again back to tech, and I just came to the conclusion, I just ain't no engineer material. So I transferred to the University of Georgia. Now at that time, there were so many veterans coming back that the, the place was overflowing with veterans and they didn't have a place to put them. So I didn't go to Athens. It didn't have any room for me. So they sent me to uh, Savannah. They had taken over Hunter Air Force Base down there and made dormitories out of the barracks and had classrooms. So I went to Savannah and stayed there for three quarters. I was finally able to get back to Athens in September of that year. That year being? Uh, 1940. 
27. Now I'm back in Athens. And we, the football season was on. And I invited this young girl who I grew up with and knew. I said, why don't you come up here for homecoming weekend? She was working. She was a secretary. Her name was Stella Cohen. C-O-H-E-N. And uh, she knew a girl from her office, a friend or something. So the two of them came up because the girl had a boyfriend up here and, uh, in Athens. So the two of them got a hotel room. And I lived somewhere then. I forgot where I lived when I was in Athens. <clears throat> so I was glad to see her. We went to the football game. And uh, somewhere along th that day, I said, you know, I heard old Lenny and what's her name? I forget their names right now. Are going to elope tonight. I said, why don't you and I elope? She said, that's a good idea. So what I did, I went down to a local jewelry store and I bought a wedding band for $5. And we went to the Justice of the Peace down next to the bus station. We got married and I had two old buddies as witnesses and we got married. So we spent our wedding night in the hotel room because the girlfriend was with her boyfriend. And they both got on the bus and went back to Atlanta. <coughs> now... Uh, her aunt said, that, and her mama said, this is not good. We must have a Jewish wedding. Okay, well, the first opportunity I had to could do that was on Thanksgiving weekend. So we had a little small family wedding at her mama's apartment. Uh, and we got married like we're supposed to be. Who was the rabbi? Do you remember? Rabbi Cohen, Joseph Cohen. He was he was the only rabbi that I really knew. He came to Atlanta in 1933, so I, I didn't know the ones before that. And uh, he married us, and uh, so now in January of the following year, I found a house for rent, a whole house for five hundred dollars. It couldn't have been a month. It must it was must have been a hundred dollars a month. And so I didn't have the money, but Stella had saved that up, so we put, we we rented it for six months. And she had the six hundred, so we moved into that house and that's where that we was in Athens. In Athens. And it was on and it was I had to get on Prince Avenue to get to my classes. And uh, I forgot the name of that street. We lived on the corner there and uh we, our first dinner guest was old Ralph Benita. He's still around. He's a CPA. And we invited him over for a spaghetti dinner, which we prepared. And it was just nice. We had our first dinner guest. And uh, then we were able, then we, I found a little, a little, little place right across on Ag Hill. And there's a building right across there where the agricultural uh, faculty and members and all uh, uh, department. So she got a job. She had excellent references and she got a paying job where she could walk across the street to work and I was a student and uh, we lived, it, what it was, this man had taken a house and he had divided it into three apartments upstairs and two of them downstairs and he had all these GIs in there and our rent was $25 a month. And we had a bedroom, a very small bedroom, a kitchen that if you had more than one person, that was all you could fit in there. And we had a community bathroom and we kept the door locked and I could tell who was in there by the sound, who was using it. So we stayed. <laughs> Go ahead. What were you studying? All right, I started off, my daddy had all, uh, my, uh, I, when I had my daddy had his shoe shop, I wanted to learn how to fix shoes, and he refused to let me become a shoemaker. He says, "No, you got to be a, uh, an accountant. You need to be a bookkeeper." Because he had done that when he was a young man. So 
I said, okay, I'm going to be an accountant. So I took two quarters in the business school, accounting 101, and the next course 02. And by that time, I said, I don't think I'm going to like this. So I just took the easy way out. I decided to major in Spanish, which I knew from home anyway. And that's what I did. I majored in Spanish, and I took a lot of uh, different kind of courses. I remember taking uh, a Greek mythology. For, I enjoyed things like that, the arts and sciences. Uh, I took two courses in Greek history and took a class in music appreciation. My major was Spanish, however, and I had to minor in French. And uh, <clears throat> upon graduation, now we moved back to Atlanta and moved in with her mother in her apartment on Boulevard. Her father? Her, her mother. Yeah, her father was deceased? Or? Yeah, he was gone a long time ago also. You never knew him? No, never knew him. And so we moved to that apartment and we had, we bought a car. We didn't have a car in Athens. We'd hitchhike everywhere in Athens. And if we went to Atlanta, we'd hitch a ride with somebody going to Atlanta that day. And uh, we got back to Atlanta, and I enrolled in Emory University. And I spent two years there earning my master's degree. Still on the GI Bill? Still on GI Bill, but by the end of that time, it ran out, or otherwise I probably would have gone for my PhD if I had more free time. And as my project, uh, at my, ma my master's project usually uh, uh, People going for a master's degree will pick some obscure thing and write about it and research it, and I thought that was just stupid. So uh, I asked my advisor, because you always had an advisor, your, your, uh, and I said, uh, uh, can I do this? I said, I'd like to translate a Spanish novel into English. So he got the approval, or if he approved it, I don't know who approved it, but I was approved. So what I did for my master's project, I translated Miguel de Unamuno was the uh, author of an, uh, uh, a philosophical uh, novel called Abel Sanchez. And I translated that from Spanish to English as what my project. What would the translation of the title be? Abel Sanchez. Oh, it's a name. Uh, it's a That's the title of the novel. And it's still Emory Library, I guess. I've got my copy at home. And so that was my uh, project. And uh, I took courses, you know, old Spanish syntax. I took some bibliography, English, and what have you. Got my master's degree. So now, here I am, no job. My wife was working. She found a job right away with, with a lumber company called Addison Rudisel Lumber Company. It was over there off of Bankhead Highway paid her very well. She was an excellent secretary. So what so she, year is it now? Is it this is, I finished em, uh, Emory in 1951. I graduated George in 49. It took two years, of course, to finish. And as a graduate assistant, by the way, I was awarded a graduate assistant, and I taught uh, three classes of Spanish during that time. Uh, so now here I am, a graduate, and no job. So what do I do? No more free education and no more monthly income because you got a little monthly income when you were a GI Bill. So at that time, I had sold shoes when I was in high school down in Atlanta on Whitehall Street. So I was pretty good at selling shoes. And at that particular time, I was selling shoes at Davison's downtown, Davison's Paxson, in the women's shoe department. Uh, earning some money until I could locate myself. And while I was there, I thought I would like to, uh, to be, be a part of the State Department. And they would give a test uh, if you wanted to be a member of that. So I took that test, and I would really like to have been a part of the State Department. And I would have enjoyed living in foreign countries and languages and different cultures. Well, I didn't pass that test. That's the most difficult test I ever took in my life. So while I'm thinking of what to do next, one day they called me from the uh, shoe department and uh, to an officer, and they said, uh, how would you like to be an assistant buyer in the men's sportswear department? And I said, yeah, I grabbed it. It was a job. It was $85 a week, and I took it. 
So I stayed at Davison's for two years as a uh, assistant buyer in the men's department. And in that interim, we live. We bought us a house, and we're living on uh, Lively Ridge Road at Briarcliff and La Vista. And uh, I'd walk up to Aunt Rachel's house, which is right up the street. And my cousin Victor and his brother-in-law would be there on Sunday. The family would get together at Aunt Rachel's, and I'd hear them talking about all this big money they were making. What do y'all do? Oh, we 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 remodel houses. Oh, can I join y'all? Can I be a part? Yeah, come on. Well. <laughs> After about a month, we hadn't made a sale, and I didn't like not having money, so I got me another job. I got, I became a city salesman for Ivan Allen Company, and I knew Ivan Allen Sr. and Ivan Allen Jr. when he was operating that, but before he became mayor. And I stayed there two years, and then... While I'm circulating around the city, I would drop in every once in a while on Spring Street, a, a friend I knew from the synagogue, and he was operating something called a motor exchange. And there was a lot of hubbub on Spring Street back then. The dealerships were there in the garages. And uh, I walked in one day and he said, Henry, how'd you like to go in the muffler business? Because I had expressed to him how I'd love to be go doing something on my own. And I said, sure. So I didn't have any money. So it, we pitched in $1,500 a piece. My daddy went down to CNS Bank and Little Five Points. He knew the manager down there. They, the managers stayed around a while back then. They don't do that anymore. They shift them around like dirty diapers in these banks nowadays, you know. But, and he co-signed that loan for 1500 And so uh, I'll never forget it. <clears throat> He had found the location, he found me a mechanic, and he'd found a source of supply for the mufflers. And it was down there on Piedmont Avenue in Kane, in an abandoned service station. We got the signs up, painted on the wall, and we opened up the doors for business. And uh, Will was the mechanic's name. And I said, Will, I want you to do something. Take my car and lift it up. We worked on jacks then and creepers. I said, Let, uh, lift up my car now and uh, let's get underneath this car. Show me where is the muffler on a car because I don't know anything about a car. I'm not mechanically inclined. So he showed me where the muffler and the tailpipe were and I just start selling muffler service. So then one day after about a year, he said, Henry, oh, Roy Reeves wants to sell his motor exchange across the street from me here on Spring Street. Let's buy it and you run it. Okay. So we put a manager in at the muffler shop and I went to Spring Street and I went into the motor exchange business. And I'm telling you, I'm the least mechanical man in the whole world. And there I was operating a garage. And I'll never forget it. I'd get a mechanic out there in the shop. I said, now, what is that right there? Oh, that's the so-and-so. Oh, well, what, do you, what is this here? And so that's how I learned the parts of an automobile engine, just asking the mechanics and the valve job and all that and the pistons and tie rods and blah, blah, blah. I didn't know any of that stuff, and I still don't in a way. So I was self-employed for many, many years. I've only had four jobs in my life. I had that job at Davison's, Ivan Allen. Now, I had a motor exchange on Whitehall Street for about nine years and I just got tired of it. It was a very grueling business, tough mechanics were hard to find. And I said, I became disillusioned uh, and wanted to do something. So I'd sit there and said, man, you got an education. Surely you can do something besides messing with these garages. So I heard there was a, through the grapevine, that there was a stock brokerage firm coming, opening up an office in Atlanta, and it was called Payne, Weber, Jackson, and Curtis. So I went down there and applied for a job as a stockbroker because another buddy of mine uh, had done that, and he'd gone with somebody else. And, and in that interview, uh, I'll never forget it, I think w what really clinched it for me <laughs> I don't know. I filled out an application. Back then, you didn't have resumes. You just filled out an application. You had an interview, and you either got the job or you didn't. And 
So in the interview, by that time, I was making enough money to become a member of the Progressive Club, which was a private club. And they had a poker rooms, and of course I was an old poker player back then when I had the money. And we had a lot of guys playing poker up there that were big time people. The Alterman Brothers, all, uh, I don't know if you know that name in Atlanta, but they played poker up there. Uh, there was lots of uh, London Iron and Works he used to play there. They had a big, and so I'm sitting at the interview and I was telling him I belonged to the Progressive Club and I played poker with all these guys. I think, and I, I told him, I think that's what clinched the job. But I never, I stayed there two years and I just, by that time I got a house, I got a mother-in-law, I'm widowed, and I got three children's support. Yeah, she passed away after 19 years, Stella did. So I w couldn't generate enough uh, c commissions. So after about two years, I quit that and went back to fixing cars. And retired when? I ain't retired yet. And, uh, and uh, from there, what did I do? Uh, I decided just uh, to concentrate on transmissions rather than motors, and I went, to, I got a location on Buford Highway. I had nine wonderful, productive years there, made lots of money, uh, some money, and uh, left that location. Uh, and then the last 15 years, I have just been, I call myself a peanut peddler. I, snacks and I go from one business to the other. I only go to automobile dealerships selling these things. And let, me, let me go ahead and go Ask back. me some questions, yeah. Yes, let me go ahead. We, we don't have too much time left. All right. Tell us uh, your memories of Pearl Harbor. Oh, Pearl Harbor. All you had were the newspapers and the newsreels that you saw at the movies. And we saw that in the newsreels. And, uh, I was just a little kid in high school. I was uh, 16 years old then, and uh, it didn't it didn't hit me like it would today. Uh, I, I just don't remember it traumatizing me as it might do today, as the twin towers would do today. Uh, yes, we saw those uh, the newsreels and the people scurrying around and the wounded and all that, and. Uh, and the day of infamy speech, but that's all I remember about Pearl Harbor. Imagine an assembly at school. Uh, that day was Sunday, of course, Pearl Harbor, and Monday we were called, uh, we had a general assembly in our uh, auditorium there at Boys High, and we heard that speech that President Roosevelt gave, the day of infamy speech. And again, uh, it didn't traumatize me, we just knew we were at war now. But we had been building up. I had sense enough to know, and anybody with good sense knew in those days that we were eventually going to get in that war. We were, <coughs> we were trying to stay out of it, but we weren't doing a good job. America had that Lend Lease program. But once the war started, I remember the uh, 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 darken your windows, put shades up. We had air raid wardens assigned to the block, and uh, then there were shortages of this, that, and the other. And by the time I got into service, I forgot all that. I had good food every day. So did you, uh, did you have any military training in high school? I was in the ROTC a short helped. while, that short helped. while, yeah. One final question. What, uh, tell us a little bit about writing home and the, uh, you know, the, the, the people's uh, reactions to yeah. you being a... Well, uh, I didn't have a lot of people to correspond with. I had two girls that I corresponded with. One was Stella, my future wife, and across the street was a girl named Lenore Arigetti. I corresponded with her uh, periodically, and then I would write home to my daddy. He was the one that corresponded with me rather than my mother, and if I had a little extra cash, I would send it home so he'd save it for me, and of course I called for it occasionally when I <laughs> when I needed some money. But that's the only corresponding that I did. I did not uh, keep up with local news and all. We didn't have newspapers aboard ship. We, had, we did have a, uh, a printed sheet, they would, and they would have some little small items about what was happening in Italy and Germany, but that was all the news we knew. We were just out there. Do you remember the atomic bomb? 
I, it was, was much made of it. I remember it being dropped, yes, on Nagasaki and uh, what have you, and that ended the war. But that was all I remember, man. I said, man, that's good. Ended the war. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was my we pleasure. enjoyed it, and uh, we'll take a look at the, uh, your pictures in